Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Zenith. That podcast is just a drug-induced and electronic dream because this week we watched Terminal. Written by Terry Nation. Directed by Mary Ridge. And aired on March 31st, 1980. Not to be confused with Terminus, the Doctor Who story. Yeah, well, I confused it with Terminus last week. I confused it with Terminus while I was watching it. (laughs) Not two hours ago. But... Speaking of Doctor Who, again, still in the interseason era, I think because of the delay between Series C and D that Series D will actually air concurrently with a season of Doctor Who, although I'm not entirely sure which one, because I think Series D moves to yeah. fall. Yep, it does. Uh, so I think 81. it'll actually probably be season 20, I want to say. Ooh, no, 19, know. sorry, of Doctor Who. Yeah, Blake 7 goes off the air for more than a year after this. Almost so, two years, actually. Right. It'll probably be season. Imagine 19. the wait. <laughs> the Liberator getting destroyed and Servo oh, possibly spoilers. dying. Spoilers. <laughs> wow, dropping the end of the story within the first two minutes of the podcast episode. I really didn't think there was any way it would be feasible to do that, and yet you found a way. <laughs> you somehow found a way. <laughs> well, like Jeff Goldblum once said, spoilers find a way. No, that's what. <laughs> oh, okay. It was you know Jurassic what? Jurassic Park. <laughs> no. Before we get into the plot, just some general housekeeping. Uh, next week, we we have confirmed and we've set up the recording and everything. So, should everything go to plan, we will be joined once again by John for making Blake Seven for Rescue next week. Which also, since this is the end of Series D, that brings us to the climactic conclusion of the What Would Blake Do segment this week. Keon's making a strange face like he forgot to come up with a what would Blake, what would Blake do moment. <laughs> it's a good thing I reminded him right now so we can think about it while we're talking. <laughs> I forgot. Last season I forgot, like, for... for uh, what did we do last season? The award? No, not the awards. No, we the did rankings last rankings. season. I forgot my forgot to do a ranking for the season finale as well. So yeah, I hope I think of one by like the end of the episode. <laughs> Basically, as is tradition, Keon forgets on the very last episode of the season to do the one thing we've been doing <laughs> for that season. And don't worry, the thing we're doing next season has the potential for greatness, but also the potential for massive failure. I think the odds can go. Either way. Either way. Well, thankfully, we have John to join us to try and figure it out the first week, and it's not just us two. Right. And those are the two big housekeeping things that I wanted to get out of the way right off the bat. And that having been said, we can jump right into Terminal, which begins with, I believe... He was the Avon covering his hands with his face, which is weird because I thought they were playing hide-and-seek on the Liberator. You mean Avon covering his face with his hands? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> I was, like, trying to process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my bad. <laughs> and he's apparently exhausted. We then cut to Space Monopoly Part 2. Dana and Callie are playing, and Villa indicates that he played this game to Galactic Master Rank and tells Dana to make a move, but she makes a move, and Callie so immediately wins on the wait, next move. Well, they're bringing back this issue of trust and truth and stuff like that right away, because Villa's like, I could trust me, Dana. I've you know played this game at this high level, and I know what to do. Dana makes the move and loses. And Villa actually, this is interesting, Villa actually says, like, well, Callie made the you know the wrong move in response. If she'd made the right move, and Dana would have won. Yeah. won. And this is like, I don't know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about, like, the epistemology of like what of, of like the right move quote unquote like, that villa sort of uh offers here right he he says like you know i've played this game on this high level and that's why i know what move to make i mean but um, really he in my opinion i don't know where you're going to go with this but i'm just going to cover for the fact you're reading through your notes in yeah. my opinion what he means by that is you know the right move for me to win, like the move that would lead me to win. So Villa's like, oh, if she'd made the ro- the right move, i.e. the move that would have, you know, I don't know how Space Monopoly works, would have like tanked Callie's finances, then Villa would have won. But from Callie's point of view, the, the wrong move is the one that would lead Villa to win. Yeah, so there, there's definitely like something semantic going on here. And I didn't even think about that. I thought that like, you know, Villa, his, his like ethos almost is like this, it's 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 this 
argument from like, well, this established way of playing the game does this thing and that's how you would win, that's how you play, but like Callie doesn't follow that, so so Dana ends up losing, which is right. a strange thing to think about, right? You think that like this higher level of play would account for all of these things, but then it somehow doesn't. Like the the authority <laughs> figures or like the authority behind this game is like inherently flawed in some way. Possibly possibly could just be Villa. Yeah. Pretending. Yeah, no, for sure. And Callie also, there's there's a uh and I only wrote Callie's lying again in my notes, and I don't know, I don't remember what that was in reference to. What did she uh, say? I did. I, that's why I wish I wrote it down because I don't remember what I wrote that in reference to. Oh, because uh, but it's in this scene. I don't remember what she says. Oh, she about says it. like you know, Dana's like, are you sure you can't read people's yeah. minds? And she's like, of course not. But you know, it might have just been between her and other Orons, and we're, we're not entirely sure. Well, actually, she not. also says even if she could, that would be cheating, so she wouldn't do it. Which immediately off the bat, yeah, coming right off the heels of cheating in the uh, the tournament. Yeah, I, or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's them trying to establish Callie as an honest person again after all those lies or, and or, deception, no, or not, or trying to establish her as this deceptive person. Doesn't matter. No real either way here. It doesn't matter in uh, multiple senses, actually. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm referring to. It doesn't matter in multiple senses. Well, when you know what's going to happen to Callie. Well, I do. That's why I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> but basically, Tarrant comes in. He's like, yo, guys, where's Avon? And Villa's like, he's on the flight deck. And Tarrant's like, he's been on the flight deck for 30 hours. And, and Villa's like, yeah, well, I offered to take over. But he said no. And he just drinks some more Soma. <laughs> They've been uh, playing this game for 9,721 moves. So oh, yeah. that sounds about right for a Monopoly game. <laughs> That's a bit below average, but, you know. <laughs> But then eventually Avon, he sets all these course coordinates through Zen and he, he gets a message and then he right. follows the message to a new set of coordinates and he's basically doing this over and over and over again. Right, Zen gets a big role in this story really more than Zen has, has gotten in weeks. For obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. And honestly, Zen, that the scene later on with Zen actually kind of hit hits hard, I think. Kind of. I would say so. Kind it's of. It's the saddest I ha- I moment have, in Blake 7. I have some problems with that scene. It's sadder than Gan's death. Much well, yes. Sadder than Gan's well, yes. Death. Of course. Absolutely. Anything sadder than Gan's death. I thought Gan's I, I death was kind of I dropped a cupcake the other day, and that was sadder than <laughs> Gan's death. But you know, dropping a cupcake is sadder than like most things. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not. So, eventually, Avon sets these coordinates. He's like, "This can't be countermanded, uh, or countermanded." And uh, we're going here, and that's the end of it. He tells Tarrant he'll kill him if Tarrant tries to stop him. Yeah, he pulls a gun on Tarrant. Though you don't actually see him pull the gun. It's like zoomed in on their faces and Avon's like, I will kill you if I have to go through you. And then it zooms out and you see Avon's got the gun on him. Right. Avon has a couple lines in this scene. This scene. I'm just going to bring up all these lines about trust and stuff like that as they appear in the episode. Um, just for just to make note of them. He says, you can take my word for it or you, and you could try trusting me in these sort of initial scenes here. I mean, I didn't think this episode is about trust at all. In my opinion, I thought this episode was about sentimentality which is why I have a problem with the Zen scene. Uh, And my first point of evidence here, since you'll be talking about trust, is that uh, uh, right when they get to this planet, in just a little bit, but I'm bringing it up now, is that Avon tells them all that sentimentality sentimentality breeds weakness and that they shouldn't be sentimental. And he tells them not to come after him, that that they meant nothing to him, that he only needed the Liberator and that was it, and that the Liberator is going to leave with them as soon as he goes down to the planet. Yeah, I mean, all part of his big charade here. Avon's big charade <laughs> shouldn't be called Blake Seven anymore. They should call it Avon's <laughs> big charade. But basically, they and fly watches through the this. ratings fall. <laughs> I don't think they'd fall. I think they go way up because everybody loves Paul Taro. But then they, they people wouldn't realize Blake Seven's back. They'd be looking, uh, you know, back in the eighties or whatever at the TV programming, the TV and like, yeah, you know, I guess Blake Seven's not on anymore. They replaced it with Avon's big charade. At <laughs> 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 the Radio Times. So they basically, they fly through this region of like mysterious space, this like red goo. Basically <laughs> like, I think they call it like liquid space or something. Yeah, Avon, uh, and I just want to mention this before we really get into this, puts on these big spiked gloves for some reason. Yeah, that's right after this when he's beaming down. Uh, and I wrote it down and I called it a gauntlet. <laughs> 
they fly through this goo and then Zen's like, oh yeah, no damage to report. Well, and then we see a scene of like some corrosive acid eating well, through like a metal. Here, here's the thing. And here's why this is funny. You know, they ask Zen, Avon wants to fly through the liquid and everyone else wants to go around. They ask Zen what the best option is. And Zen's like, you know, well, even though I don't foresee any danger flying through it, I'd say better be safe than sorry and go around. Mm-hmm. At least in a more computerized way. This and is actually Avon, my what would Blake do moment, but continue, finish. <laughs> and Avon's like, you know, forget that, Zen. We're going through it. <laughs> and Zen, then, you know, as you said, Zen reports, like, no damage or whatever. And then you cut to, like, this slime mold just, like, <laughs> cutting through the hole. <laughs> okay, so my what would Blake do moment is Blake, in my opinion, was always confident in the Liberator's uh, strength, but never overconfident as Avon seems to be in this scene. I mean, I don't know about that. Remember Mission to Destiny? And they fly through the, like, vortex thing or the astro... It was an asteroid uh, storm or whatever. Okay, but that was an asteroid storm. Let's look at Avon's track record. Avon took them into a black hole. all right, yeah. Like, this season. (laughs) In uh, Shadow 2.0, which I can't remember the name of. Dawn of the Gods. Dawn of the Gods, that's it. And then, so here with this goo that Zen is explicitly like, yo, we shouldn't fly through this goo. Avon's like, nah, nah, we're going through the goo. Blake, you know, when you find out why Avon's going to the planet, say what you will about Blake even wanting to go to this planet. Blake, I think, would have been like, no, I think, you know, we'll go around this weird region of goo space. Like I said, I think Blake was confident in the Liberator's abilities, but never overconfident. Yeah, you know, if I, I agree with that. I think if, if if the situations were reversed, right, if it was, mm-hmm. you know, I'll just spoil it now anyway, if it was Blake looking for Avon, right, I don't think the urgency would have been there. Right. So Blake would have for sure gone around, I think, in that case. Anyway, they <laughs> they reach this, this mysterious planet called Terminal. Uh, and, and Terminal's like, oh, Terminal, I thought it, I thought it like blew up. And, and sort of Avon's the, like, what? You know he, about it? Yeah, the, so Terrence sort of explains the backstory. It, it was this man-made planet, basically, um, that was you. It was created to simulate evolution, and they, people wanted to study the evolution of Earth. So they tried to like sim- re. They tried to simulate that on a on a man-made planet, right? And succeeded, I guess, as you find out later. Well, so the, the, what's interesting about Terminal is that it's a man-made planet, but it's not spherical. It's an ellipsoid. So Yeah, I just thought there were some weird, like, view screen shenanigans going on with that, but, you know, <clears throat> probably not. I don't believe so. No, because the, the view screen never really distorts anything. Yeah. They use Zen's final trick, like, ha <laughs> going to just distort this one image. <laughs> And this is, you know, when they arrive at Terminal, Avon basically just lays down the law. He's like, look, guys, I'm going down to the planet. None of you can follow you. Follow me. If you follow me, I will kill you. The Liberator set in 12 hours to fly to the nearest inhabited planet, which they looked up uh, earlier when they were in like a region of empty space. The Liberator will fly there and then they'll release to your command and you can do whatever you want with it. But you can't follow me. I'll kill you. And basically that's it. I just needed the Liberator to get you. I didn't need any of you. I don't want any of you. Now bye. And that's what he says the line about sentimentality. Yep. Line from Dana. Why not trust us? Well, then Callie's like, well, if you want one of your typical, logical, cold-hearted reasons, like, we can't afford to lose you, Avon. He's like, doesn't matter. I don't need you. And Phil is right. like, it does, you don't need to explain, uh, uh, Avon. We'll just follow you wherever. <laughs> and I'm like, Villa! Villa! Well, as soon as Avon leaves, they're like, all right, who's beaming down after him? <laughs> And it's Tarrant and Callie. Right. Which is an interesting pairing. Yeah, it is. Actually. And, and I'm, I'm glad that it was this pairing. Not because I think Tarrant and Callie are the necessarily the most interesting pair, but because I think Villa and Dana are a pretty interesting pair. <laughs> <laughs> well, so they get ready to beam down and Villa's like, if Avon finds out, he'll kill you. And Tarrant's like, well, that's just a trick. Avon won't know. And then Villa's like, but what if he sees you? And he's like, well, we'll duck then. I'm like, uh oh. Perfect plan. We get a, a scene of Avon coming down on the planet, teleporting down to the planet, and he just sort of looks around and and wanders off into the distance. They're sort of in a field. Well, he finds this tracker ball kind of thing. Oh, right. Yeah, he finds this uh, yeah tracker ball. And it identifies his palm print and his voice print, and then it like gives him a direction to walk in 
and he follows it. And then when he reaches his destination, I thought this was really funny. But Paul Darrow, I, I'm pretty sure he had a lot of fun at this, kind of just chucks the ball to the side. And it just yeah. lands in a bush. And there's just a shot of it landing in the bush. Prop designer's <laughs> like, oh. Prop designer's like, oh, no, my prop. <laughs> He's like, thank God it held up, though. <laughs> Made that out of tinfoil. <laughs> Yeah, and this is actually really interesting. The the line is palm and voice prints confirm identity. Mm-hmm. And like this episode really calls that entire idea into question. <laughs> well, does it though is the question. Does it? And here's well, here's the thing. I'm we're going to get to Servland's speech, which is basically one of the best scenes of the show later on. But I don't know if we can really I don't like I don't know. There's so many questions I have about this episode and so many like so many, I think, valid theories that you can have about who this even is at the end of the episode. This Blake figure. And what that Blake figure even does to people. But hey, we're not there yet. <laughs> so the Liberator's getting screwed over by this slime mold. I really liked how they're, how this is done because... Uh, I, don't know, I just really like slime well, so, molds. Well, Villa notices that the energy banks are being completely depleted, and he's like, what the hell? And then he asks Zen about it, and Zen's like, oh, the damage being caused is exceeding regenerative capabilities. And Villa's like, what? <laughs> What's doing the damage? And then- and Dana comes in, she's like, what? what is going on, Villa? Like, what have you done? And then Zen is like, I don't know what's causing the damage because the sensors on the outside of the hull are damaged as well, so I can't scan. And Villa's like, God damn it. And he orders uh, the self repair mechanism to turn off because Villa's like, look, they're fighting a losing battle anyway, and we need the energy to do other things like teleport and operate Zen right now. Yeah, and you, you get the sense that like Zen is, is uh, dying. At, well, at dying, but at this for a while because that like is inter- this is interspersed with scenes on the planet as well. So this is going on over a period of time because mm-hmm. they're trying to get the Liberator back to normal and it's just not working. Right. But it's being overtaken by this. Goo, which is like, goo. it's like, but I think, it, I think Zen calls it an enzyme that's eating away at the the, right. the composition of the liberator. It looks like a slime mold uh, to me. And uh, slime mold, molds are really interesting because they're uh, often like single celled. I think they are single celled things, organisms, but they're actually like really, they can do strange things. Like they can map the, like they can map rail systems. If you put them on a map, they they react to light. They don't like light, so they stay away from light. So if you put light like where mountains are, like on a map of the U.S. or like mountains or rivers and stuff, they can like map rail systems, and they can do all this other like weird stuff that you would think they wouldn't be able to do. And like some of them, some of them like look like bugs. So mm-hmm. they they mimic animals and like, but not all of them. Like some of them just take on like the characteristics of like animals and hunt like animals. They're really weird, and they can do like these crazy things. Reminds me of an episode of uh, Star Trek and, uh, Enterprise, sorry, where they have this like slime goo, and and the doctor's like, we give it, we can the give doctor? it. <laughs> the doctor on the ship oh. <laughs> is like, we can give, we give this, we give this goo like genetic D- or DNA from like a living organism, and then this goo will grow to an exact genetic duplicate of whatever we give it, and then. It'll live it, like an accelerated life cycle in like seven days. It'll live the entire life cycle of the organism. We can like harvest whatever tissue we want from it. So they had like a crew member who was dying and they needed like a rare brain tissue. So they, they generated this copy of him and then harvested the brain tissue from the copy. But that episode's actually really interesting because it asked a lot of like philosophical questions about like, oh, we created this. We created this being with the sole purpose of harvesting like brain tissue from it right. to save our crew member. It's like, is that right? And then- it gets twisted like at the start. Flox is like, "Oh, you know, we can harvest the brain tissue, and, we, and you know, the the organism will survive and it'll live a, a natural lifespan." But then, if Flox discovers that if they harvest the brain tissue, it'll kill the organism. So, like, can we kill this organism that we built or that we made specifically to save our crew member? And yeah. anyway, but I was just reminded of it because you were talking about things taking on the properties of <laughs> of other things and the slime goo just eating away at the ship here. Yeah. And it's done really well. You know, it takes over the Liberator gradually over the course of the episode. And first, it's just a, a few patches. But when Servaline gets on, I guess she doesn't notice because she's only done the Liberator yeah, once. That, that was the one thing I was wondering about this episode. Like, how did Servaline not notice the yeah. mold all over like, the place? I was able to look past it. But uh, when, when she's on the Liberator, it's totally taken over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the liquid space also reminds me of another Star Trek thing. In Star Trek Voyager, they enter this this thing called fluidic space, which is which is like outer space, but it, it's, it's fluid and... and also in that it like 
eats through the ship and they have they can huh. only spend so long in fluidic space before they have to return to regular space. So okay, basically so they're getting the yeah. tax down on the planet. Yeah. Well, Avon's sort of tailing these two people. No, the, no, okay. The, Tarrant and Callie are tailing the two people who are tailing oh, Avon. Oh, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Avon goes into this... Avon then gets attacked by the two people who's tailing him, but he makes it into this kind of, like, building that the, the tracker leads him to. It's, it's sort of an underground area. He, he un- It looks like it's covered by solar panels. He sort of yeah, like takes these panels off, panels. right? And he, he goes down this ladder to this underground facility. And Callie and Tarrant are uh, tailing him, and they get attacked by these, like gorilla looking well, things so, almost they first they watch as one of the two people gets brutally murdered by these by these animal things in this really rather gruesome scene where we see this lady pick up the tracker ball and then scream as she gets visibly <laughs> mauled by this bear creature thing yeah and i was like wow that is horrifying <laughs> yeah and then, these things don't give up right they just no when, yeah when they just keep coming and, and uh, tarrant are attacked later on there's just and they they use weapons as well. They have like these clubs or sticks or whatever. I think later on, Servland mentions that these animals were created by the scientists. I think Tarrant alluded to it earlier because he says Terminal was basically just one giant planet-sized laboratory yeah. for creating things. And Servland later says that because it was a man-created planet, the whole ecosystem is was like man-created and evolved from like these things that they created in the lab. So it's like all sorts of sideways. Yeah, I mean, she she says, um, this is getting a little ahead, but she says, like, this is what humans are going to become. Yeah. Although I think Avon, I think Avon disputes this. I don't remember. I don't quite remember, even though I watched this again two hours ago. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's an interesting, there's a really interesting scene here. And this is, uh, I don't have anything else to say other than, like, this is interesting. Uh, and this is surprisingly like with how mundane this is this is one of the like my favorite parts of the episode i've been reading a lot of uh derrida and leotard lately who if you don't know who they are are like philosoph like post-structuralist like linguistic theorists and philosophers from the 20th century and i've also been reading a lot of walter benjamin and carl Krauss, who are mm-hmm. who predate who are a little earlier early 20th century writers but are almost kind of in the same vein yeah, ter- there's this line from Tarrant where you see, you know you see Avon go down into the shaft and Callie and Tarrant are following him and as soon as like the coast is clear for them to follow him down underground, Tarrant goes like some kind of shaft. He he says this exact line, some kind of shaft cover could explain where Avon vanished to, and that was such like a striking line to me because as the viewer, you know what Avon has done, you know mm-hmm. he's gone down the shaft. Yet from Tarrant's perspective, he doesn't know that at all. Right, he's not. He, he he just speculates like, oh, this could explain where Avon has gone off to because I guess he didn't see Avon go down. Right. And uh, I don't know. I think this just perfectly captures like, and this is a word that I I, I, I read recently and I haven't really been using in on the podcast, but I guess I probably should have because it's related, but like testimony, right? Like mm-hmm. this account that you give. Well, you used it at the start of Series C and then all of a sudden you dropped off the map huh. using it. No, I don't remember that actually. Yeah, well, I remember. Have what, uh, referred did, to did Howell's you, testimony or something like yeah. that? Yeah, well, uh-huh. you, you referred to testimony quite a few times, actually, at the start of Series C. Huh. <clears throat> That's interesting. I forgot that I did that. <laughs> but yeah, this, uh, I mean, when you look at testimony as like this thing, and, and Derrida has this text, I, I forget where what book it's from, but he talks about like this paradox of testimony, how testimony is something that is both unique and necessarily like repeatable because like mm-hmm. he says testimony like when you when you go up like in in court or whatever and give your testimony you're saying like any reasonable person and that word reasonable is actually really important in law and stuff but like any reasonable person who was standing where i was who had the senses that i do who could see as as well as i did and has control over their senses to the same capacity as i do would have seen the same thing that's what you're saying when you're taking that oath not to lie you're saying yeah i mean you're not saying that you're giving facts you're what you're really saying is like from my point of view, where I was standing, the the typical person would have seen what I'm about to tell you. Mm-hmm. But there's also like a, a theoretical thing here going on, where like if you <clears throat> if you're if you're there to give your testimony, it means that you're in some way irreplaceable. It means that you're in some way unique. Uh, and 
look that I mean the t- I, I'm just kind of trying to explain like and work through it myself what what mm-hmm. this text is all about because it's confusing um, but all of this uh, the 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 point to all of this in in this text or whatever from Derrida is that like there's a fictionality inherent in all and, and any story you can give whether it's whether you're claiming it's fiction or nonfiction or whatever there's a a fictionality inherent in all of it there's the the act of telling right injects some sort of the the possibility of fiction mm-hmm. and that's what he says i think like the testimony is what it is because there's always the underlying possibility of fiction and yeah i don't know <laughs> it's interesting and that, and that's and i was thinking about that's something we've actually kind of lost in Mm-hmm. This is going off on a big tangent, but something that's that's actually lost in English where we have this difference between story and history, right? We say story right. is like this made up thing, like I'm going to tell you my story and, versus I'm going to tell you my history, right? And that's not necessarily, even with direct cognates in other languages like Spanish, like Historia, that's not necessarily the case that those two are entirely different or that one is thought of as fictional and the other not, but hey, you know, whatever. <laughs> Well, Tamit and Dana, Callie, so while they're in the tube, at some point, Callie's like, we're going to keep going down. And Tamit's like, well, you don't really have a choice because I'm going to keep going down. <laughs> Callie's like, oh, okay. jumps. <laughs> Meanwhile, Avon, I think at this point, meets Blake or quote Blake, unquote Blake. He's, he's going through the corridors and he's he's hiding from some guards and stuff like that. And he yeah, he, he makes it to, to Blake or whoever this is or if this is even... If this is a dream, given like the track record know. of Series C, could be Blake's long lost twin brother, also played by Gareth Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing: like later on, Servland, we'll get into this more. Says like it was a drug induced and electronic dream in that speech. That is her most probably probably her most famous sort of bit of dialogue from the series. I've heard I'd heard this before. I mean, this but, scene is very dreamlike in the way that it's shot. It's an entirely black room except for Blake and his life support system. And there's like a single light shining on Blake and his support, life support system and yep. Avon, the the angles that it's shot at. It's all very, uh, it's very dreamlike. There's a lot of soft focus going on. So all the edges are kind of blurred. They're not really defined. Right. Like the whole scene is shot to be very dreamlike. But this is where, again, I think this episode is about sentiment because Blake, because Avon says, oh yeah, you know, I wanted to know what the treasure was. And then Blake says something like, your sentiment is showing Avon. And then Avon's like, oh, no, 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 it's not. Which I think ties in with the beginning of the episode. When he beams down, Avon says sentimentality breeds weakness. And if you really think about it, Avon's sentiment for Blake is what leads to everybody's downfall in this episode. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I don't think that just ties back to the beginning of this episode, but really this series in general. You Looking back on Series C, I can totally see how you can pull out these moments and say that Series C is really a series that focuses on how, and this is something we brought up time and time again, so we don't need to get too into it, but like mm-hmm. how in A and B, it looked like Avon was this cold-hearted person and Blake was, uh, you know, more uh, more sentimental, I guess. But Series C is like, well, is that really the case? And I think or, not even only that, I think Series C as a whole talks about sentiment for all the characters and demonstrates that on the whole, these prior attachments, these sentiments have been the downfall of the Liberator crew, you know, Callie's home world and Zelda, they go back to save Zelda. They end up basically almost losing the Liberator to Serverland. Again, when they have Terrence's brother show up, Dita, when he shows up, they go because it's it's Terrence's brother. Yep. And again, they almost lose the Liberator to Serverland. Serverland almost starts an intergalactic war. Every time that in this season that someone has shown compassion or sentimentality about someone, whether it be someone in the Liberator crew or someone from their past, it's led to basically failure or failure like near or, or, failure or something yeah like negative outcomes basically right at the, but at the same time um, and in this story it basically goes to its natural conclusion where they lose everything yeah at the same time though i have a hard time saying that like this series is anti like feeling well i don't and I, I don't, don't think and i think it's actually the very opposite i think this is like anti you know cold hard uh, well, well i don't think it, I, well, I wouldn't say it's anti feeling I think it's it's like I think it's like Avon basically tries to say like you know back in series A when he said I don't know why caring for someone requires you to make stupid decisions I think 
it's not anti-feeling. I think it's anti-making stupid decisions because you're blinded by your feelings. But yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even say it's that. I'd say it's like pro all these things. Like yeah, of course we're gonna go help Zelda, and of course we're gonna go back and save the unborn children, and of course we're gonna go see Dita and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's something, and I'd have to rewatch all these, but something inherent in all these episodes where that's that's at the end of the day, it was good that they did all of this. I mean, I think so. I agree with that. I just think that at the same time, the series is saying, like, don't let your feelings be the only thing that guides you. Like, make sure that you're actually considering, like, the logistical element, like, the logical element of this situation, like, the emotionless point of view. Like, consider both, I think, is what this series is trying to say. I think, in my opinion, what the series is saying is that you need both to be effective. And I think this story is an element of where, say, Avon runs completely only on emotion and it leads completely to the downfall. Whereas something like, you know, the, the one where they go back to Callie's home planet, Children of Auron, like they didn't run completely on emotion. They still went, you know, there were still those moments like, oh, this could be a trap. Like this moment, this beacon could be a trap. Like maybe we should consider yeah. if we really want to go do this. And they take a vote and like they do all these things that like, they don't just go immediately, I think is the point. I don't sure, know. The, the that's re- just what I pull out of it. Yeah, the the reason, and that's that seems pretty valid. You know, there's pretty solid examples of that. The reason I would uh, go against that and say that, like, this is just, you know, what, this, this episode, I think, configures, like, what Avon does here is a good thing is, like, I get this sense, and at the end, they, they do lose, like, all they really had, which is Liberator, but at, at the end, there's... I don't know, there's something positive about that ending where they walk off and Avon smiles and I don't know, there's just something I mean, but to me there's something and, and so positive about maybe that. Maybe we should explain what actually happened before we really get right, into we this. Can, yeah, we should probably go through the rest of the plot, but you know, say what you want to say. I just want to say that smile from Avon is less like haha I won and more like haha Servland lost. We're still in a shit situation though. Like that was what I got out of Avon's smile at that at the end there, that Avon realized that yeah, they're in a shit situation, but Servland got it worse. Oh, we'll 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 get there to get there when we, when we get there. Let's uh, let's explain the sort well, of. Well, Avon gets captured this. basically. He tell well, he has this conversation with Blake. Right. He tells Blake that he's going to get him out of there, and Blake says, "No, I can't survive for very long off my life support system." Gareth Thomas has has grown a, a beard, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Yeah, because he says these people brought him back from the brink of death, and he has to he has to be in the life support system to survive, basically. Right, and Avon's like, you know, we're going to get you out of here, we're going to get you onto the Liberator, and we're going to get you into a safe position. He's like, no, I need three months to be able to be moved. Avon's like, damn it, I'll come back for you then. Yeah. So Avon tries to get out of there, and he is captured. And this is where things start getting a little strange, like the sequence of events and what actually happens. Because well, because I think, I think the sequence... He, until this point has been like roughly real time one to one, but I think in this part the Callie and Tarrant and Dana and, and Villa sections are actually running just a slight tad bit out of sync with the Avon sections. Well, probably, and but and also the thing like with them knocking him out and then bringing him back to the place where they knocked him out and saying like we have to make this seamless and stuff like and Serverland saying what you saw was just a dream made me seriously question like. Was this drug-induced state? Was Blake actually there? Is Blake really dead? Is he not? Who is this guy? Who is this, like, Blake figure? And what is he, like, doing Well, what's what's interesting is that I think the story sets up Blake to be a sort of Jesus figure, which I think kind of ties into the the, what would Blake do? What would Jesus do? But I think because... (laughs) Wow. Wow. We have all these... In this story specifically, from this point onward, we have all these conflicting accounts about... What happened to Blake at the end of the war, right, which the, not only get, conflict within the story, conflict to things we heard like throughout the season. Right. We get Avon looking in the computers a little actually before this while he's snooping around. He looks in the computers and he, he finds out that at least as far as the computer is concerned, Blake is still alive. Right. Which, again, maybe that Servland planted that information in the computer. But basically, let's just explain this so yeah. we can talk about it. Servland corners avon is like look you, you can talk to blake if you want and he's like i already talked with blake and serverland's like oh you did well that's unusual but okay let's do some bargaining and avon's like well i just i want blake and you can have the liberator i guess and then he calls the liberator on his teleport bracelet tells villa to basically run away as fast as he can and villa right. tries to tell back we can't the liberator's falling apart but avon just shut work. off because yeah. serverland puts a gun to his head talent and callie get captured so they get brought in and then 
Uh, and then Servalan's like, oh, I think renegotiation is on the table. Right. And then they basically agree to let Servalan have the Liberator because they don't really have a bargaining position. And this is when she reveals that, like, Blake wasn't actually, or, quote, wasn't actually alive, unquote. Or the, And that, that wasn't even a real person, right? She tells mm-hmm. Avon that that was a drug-induced state. Yeah. And she has this big sort of monologue. And uh, you have you heard this, this monologue before? Cause Not I before the show, no. Huh. This is a pretty, I think, famous sort of bit from Blake 7. <laughs> and it's done really well. This is Jacqueline Pierce at her best. Mm-hmm. It is done really well. I think it's the best part of this episode. She says, Potentially this entire season. Um, there's a lot of stuff, that actually, that's sort of out of order that I'm going to be wanting to bring up. Um, but in this moment, she says... I wouldn't expect you to take my word for it. So you can, s- or she's explaining like how she like led Avon there, right? She mm-hmm. like planted this information that Blake was still alive, knowing that he would come and stuff like that. I think Avon even admits like, yeah, you know, I thought this might be a trap, but you know, the 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 chance was worth it or something like that. But I still went for it, basically. Yeah. She, but she, but she created. She said like, you know, we set up the computers, we planned this for months, we used this. We, this uh, system or whatever to and, and these drugs to make you think to make you think you were talking to Blake. She says, "I wouldn't expect you to take my word for it, so you can see him and talk to him." And yeah, I don't know. There's there's this w- actually weird thing here uh, about like Servalan's epistemology too, because she says like when she tells Avon that Blake is actually dead, she goes mm-hmm. like, "I saw him die with my own eyes." Yeah. Yet at the same time, she's like, we just tricked you, you know, we tricked your senses into thinking that Blake was still alive. Yeah. So, like, there's this weird, like, almost paradoxical thing going on here. It's like, where, where you, she tells Avon, like, you saw him, but, like, you couldn't trust your senses in that moment. That wasn't true. But I saw him. I, like, I know the truth. I have access to the truth. Mm-hmm. I saw him die. Right. And, I don't, like, I just, I don't think well, anything I think, really. I think, can, I think that's supposed to be ambiguous because. For sure. Servalan has all this power. You, I think it's supposed to make you wonder why didn't Servalan then, if she sees Blake die, why doesn't she take Blake's actual body? Or why doesn't she actually check that it actually is Blake? Because she, she said she was at this battle. She saw him die. Like, I saw, I think it, it's she supposed, says I saw his body. I yeah. saw it cremated. So if, I guess the other question is supposed to make you ask then is that why didn't they use like Blake's actual body in the life support system? Or, or did they? Or you, you know, know, or did they? Is it actually Blake in the life support system? Because Blake says, "Oh, they brought me back from the brink of death." Possibly, Servland doesn't know that Blake is even actually like real life alive, alive, right. and I mean, she thinks she just constructed this whole thing for Avon. Like, Servland's speech is filled with with double meanings and and inconsistencies that I think are supposed to call into question like does Servalan even actually know Blake's current state and I think it conflicts with everything everything, everything <laughs> from the season too because we we hear throughout the season every so often someone mentions oh Blake is at XYZ or Blake you know we hear Blake makes it onto a medical ship there's also a Blake clone like who is stuck on a planet but maybe not stuck anymore you know who yeah there's the Blake clone on. who could be the one that Servalan saw die right like there's so many possibilities here that I just it's and this is really cool I think is it like at the end of this season we get these quote unquote answers but do we really know any more than we did before no I think in fact we 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 know less or what we thought we knew is called in the question even more well I think that's why it sets up Blake kind of as this Jesus figure because you keep hearing about him now like in the background or at, at least maybe not as as a Jesus figure if you don't want to be you know, Christian about it, like just as this mythical figure, you keep hearing these stories about him. Like, oh, he was sighted X, Y, Z. He was sighted on X planet or I saw him die. For sure. Here, or I saw him in the life support system. Like everybody's seeing him all over these, these different uh, points of the galaxy. And it's building up even more so than series A and B did this myth of, of Blake. We talked a lot in series A and B about how Blake was more a myth than an actual doer of things like he kind of rested on his laurels and was able to do things because right. people <laughs> believed Blake was his legendary figure. I think in series C we see that from the other side. We see all these stories about Blake. Oh, Blake's here, Blake's there, Blake's dead, Blake's not dead. It's effective in that it ties into series A and B because it shows us what we've previously only heard has been happening. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. The Federation was scared of Blake becoming a martyr too, like you know, 
before the series started and, and you mm-hmm. know, in those early episodes, that's why they accuse him of, of molesting those children and stuff like that. And that's the other yeah. thing, like Serverland wow. saying he's dead, that could actually be like a massive misfire. You know, they quote, it's like, I'm stronger in death than I ever was in life. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah, there's, there's also this thing here. I don't know if this is the most opportune time to bring it up, but I think it's somehow related to this. Is, you know, you talk about sentimentality and like the search for Blake Mm-hmm. And Blake and Blake's era of the show, series A and B, are like this simpler time, right? This time when not all these things were being called into question, right? We saw this mm-hmm. from Blake's perspective. We saw like Blake's version of the truth. We saw this one version of the truth, whether it was what we saw in The Liberator or what the Federation was, you know, disseminating to people as like, here, this is the truth. Right. But there's a line from Avon here when he's talking to Blake or whoever this guy is. <laughs> There were times when your simple-minded certainties might have been refreshing. Yeah, that was right before he followed up with your sentiment is showing. Yeah. And Avon, as is, has been hinted at and is for sure revealed in this episode, is searching for like that, that time when things were much more simple than they are now. Mm-hmm. When the truth was absolute. You know, and, and... Yeah, I don't know, man, like... It's just, it's cool to me. I really like it. CBC is definitely, we're at the end, so we can kind of talk about this. I think CBC is, in my opinion, superior to series A and B as a whole. I would say the the quality of episodes may be a little higher in series A or B, just as as an average. But I think overall, I think series C together is is a much stronger season than the other two, in my opinion. Yeah, let's let's um let's finish the yeah, plot. Yeah, finish the we plot. About so that, just so. a little bit more. Serverland gets beamed up to the Liberator and then Villa somehow tricks <laughs> the guard awesome. into letting them take Aura because he's like, it's an art installation that I built myself. Please don't make me Villa leave it. sweating bullets in this scene. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, yeah, you can take it, I guess. And so he beams down with Aurak and then Serverland's on the on the Liberator and it's blowing up and she's like, maximum power. And then it starts blowing up and she yeah. runs to the teleporter room. Falling apart. It starts falling apart and blowing because we see one of the... Right. Um, the, the like the, nacelles yeah fall off and she runs to the teleporter room and oh, it, we skipped zen's death scene oh my god it gosh. blows up oh yeah zen, zen dies uh, and this is actually really sad sad but zen okay so zen dies and he starts referring to himself as i and, and villa's yep. like he's never used i before because zen's like i failed you i'm sorry i failed you and, and villa's like oh he's never used i before and then Zen shuts off for good. I don't really know how to feel about this scene, honestly. Why? What was? What do you think was? I just wrong felt with it? almost like it was kind of out of place. I think my problem with it is that it came too early in the episode. Huh? I think it needed to come later. I think it needed to come after we meet Blake because I think, in my opinion, it would have been stronger if we we get this moment of elation because Blake's alive immediately followed by Zen is dead as it stands it it happens about halfway through the episode and then Villa and Dana proceed to muck about on the Liberator for another about 20 minutes well you know you gotta keep that 7 number right you can't introduce like Blake's alive because then it would be Blake's 8 you gotta kill Zen for I'm kidding I'm kidding they've got Orac though well they have 7 currently they have the 5 humans and Orac and Zen I mean, when the head blade. No, I mean, it was, it was just it was just a joke. Well, no, I mean, I know they had had more. In my opinion, I think it would have just worked better later in the episode. Maybe, yeah. Just because for me, it felt almost like it came out of nowhere. I mean, it didn't because like the Liberator's dying, but it just seemed like it was just plopped in between. Sure. Eh, scenes. Sure. This is also Zen's moment of like his series C moment of like we didn't really know all there was to know about Zen because he actually does have emotions like Orak. <laughs> But then he dies, so it doesn't matter. No, it does matter because that's what makes the scene so sad to me. Like he was just suppressed, like he was he was doing his job as a computer and suppressing his own ego. I don't know if he was suppressing his emotions so much as he developed them when he died. Yeah, that's probably the better way of putting it. Uh, It reminded me a lot of 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 a scene from Person of Interest where, if you don't know about Person of Interest, the gist of it that you need to know what I'm about to explain is that this guy creates this artificial intelligence to detect crime. Um, and basically, at the end of series four, this artificial intelligence, like over the course of the series, has developed this personality. And then in episode four, for the first time, it talks directly to his creator and calls him father. And it's like this really big moment because this, the machine has never talked yeah, to anyone before or shown moment. 
any indication that it actually like has emotions emotions like it cares about the people that work with it but it hasn't right. been shown to have this like emotional attachment to someone until this moment where it calls its creative father and this moment reminded me a lot of that because like in zen's final moments he says i failed you like i failed not like oh the liberator failed or yeah. syst- the systems are failing like i failed you yep so Anyway, down on the planet, Avon's dejected because he thinks they've lost, and Terrence's like, no, just check out the screen, and it blows up, and then he, Terrence's like, we got to find a way off this planet. Still lots to do. At the sitcom moment, they all like walk away, and Avon smiles, and it ends on this smile, and this is so sitcom because in my head, this, in my head, you have to envision this with me because it's, it's just great. You know those sitcom openings where it always like freeze frames on like, the yeah. actor, and then has like the little title card at the bottom like, yeah. and blink so oh, in my mind the camera and smile yeah, in my mind this ends with Avon smiling and then it starts playing this cheesy like, like yeah just cheesy <laughs> outro theme and then it's like starring because this was supposed to be like the end of the show it's like eh, that yeah. was a starring Paul Darrow as Avon and then it like cuts to like a silly shot of Tarrant like well, smiling like that's the end we, we brought up the prisoner I know what you mean we brought up the prisoner last week and that's the end of the prisoner really it is there, there's these characters who are introduced in the last episode who get these cards and then you get the final one which is Patrick McGowan but it doesn't say his name it just says prisoner but this is what I was imagining in this moment like Paul Darrow is Avon he's just smiling this yeah. cheesy smile as he's walking <laughs> off screen and it's playing with this like I don't know xylophone or vibraphone <laughs> remix of the Blake Seven theme over it. The one that, uh, and I'll, I'll share this in the show notes, but uh, RG actually linked it on Twitter. Um, is uh, it's a remix of the theme, and it's I think it's the exact song you're looking for for this moment. <laughs> Maybe I'll create this sitcomy <laughs> outro style thing <laughs> in my free time. I I liked the smile though. I actually really liked this ending because I don't know. I think it brings this we. we this positivity to what we were talking about before this thing where like yeah all this bad stuff happened because of our our naive trust and our wanting to go back to 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 this sentimental time and us having sentiment but at the end it was all like the fact that we went through all of that outweighs all the damages we suffered whether it does or not is another question i mean like i said i see the smile as like avon going well we're in some pretty deep nonsense now how are we gonna get up like but when at least I'm playing, we have each other well, right? here's the thing like, like mine is zen what i'm thinking of is like when i play golf and i had a really crappy shot I, you know i just laugh because it's like ah, uh, well that's just golf like hit a shitty shot now i'm in a shitty situation oh well that's what i get from avon here he's like well we lost the liberator we lost uh blake uh, presumably again we own we never saw the treasure room uh damn it (laughs) and he's just like well what can you do that's life (laughs) let's go see if we can survive (laughs) yeah because we mentioned that um well, we did mention it actually yeah. that that the the creatures that attacked them were a, like a, a version of humans from the mm-hmm. like far future that it evolved at a way quicker pace. And that's and that's how it ends. That's how the show was supposed to end. They didn't actually. It was very late, and that's part of the reason why series D took so long is because they didn't even say they wanted to do a series D till like this episode had aired the yeah. first time. Which, if you don't know, for television. That's Months typically later. pretty rare. Typically, you'll get renewed during the season. Uh, if you get renewed at the end of the season or after the season ends, that typically means your next season's going to be the last <laughs> one. The uh, actors, when this aired, apparently didn't even know that there'd be another season yeah. yet. Michael Keating, you know, got to give it to him. Coming back for, <laughs> for every episode, every next, episode season. next season. He's the man. Well, Avon comes oh, back. Yeah, every, Avon Paul Darrow comes back for every episode next season. Yeah, too. the only reason why Paul Darrow isn't in every episode is the way he back. He wasn't introduced in he's Spacefall. Was Spacefall the first yeah, episode? The, the, way, the way back in Spacefall or Space... Yeah, the way back and then Spacefall. Yeah, you're right. Cause, because cause, the anniversary special is the way ahead. Yeah, and because no, I'm coming back. That's how I remember it. It's because the first one ends with no, I'm coming back. And... Yeah, so that brings us to a close of Series C, actually. Yeah. So maybe we can just jump right back into that conversation that we kind of started a minute or two ago. Yeah, I was saying that I think Series C overall is a stronger season than A and B. I just want to also mention that I think we see some Liberator debris in the credits. 
And maybe I'm just making that up, but it looked like know. there were I, a few little specks in the credits, the credits this time. <laughs> that I didn't <laughs> notice before. Notice before. <laughs> but I think CBC strongest season. I think the quality of episodes on average is maybe just a little bit lower, or maybe just the enjoyment that I got out of the episodes is a little bit lower individually. But I think overall, as like a completed piece, I think it's stronger. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I was gonna come in and say the same exact thing. So thanks for stealing my thought. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, well, so what was your what would Blake do moment? Mine's sort of an overarching one here because like, I just thought of it right now. But like, and it's something we mentioned. <laughs> yes, I put you on, on the spot well, because I wanted you know, to know if you thought of one. No, it, it's something we mentioned earlier on, which is that if the situations were reversed, if this was Blake looking for Avon, mm-hmm. I don't think there would be as much urgency. I don't think there would be as much sentiment behind it. Right. And I don't know if Blake would even go as far as Avon did. Yeah, I don't think he would have either. Blake, I think, always saw people just as tools to get to their end game, to his end game, sorry. Right. And to that end, I think Avon was useful, yeah, because he could crack computers and he can fix the Liberator, but it wasn't like he was irreplaceable, really. Right, and I'm thinking maybe he would have gone as far for Jenna or even Villa, but maybe right. not Maybe not someone like Avon or Gan. It depends how valuable I think he would consider their... Skill set, definitely not for Gan. <laughs> Sorry, Gan. But I, uh, no, I completely agree with that. And that's actually where I think I'm done with series, or at least done saying things on series C, for now, anyway. Uh, I am curious to see where series D is going to go. All I know is that uh, they get a new ship and it's called Scorpio. Yep. That's all I know about it. I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm surprisingly in the dark for a lot of Series D as well. Um, I have. I know some spoilers late. I know how the show ends and I know some other spoilers yeah, that's true. Actually, late. Actually, I know the final scene of the show. And I know, I know Scorpio exists. That's it. There's some, yeah, there's some foreshadowing lines for that final scene actually in this episode, but. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> where Avon's like, I thought our deaths would be intertwined and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If, I don't even know if Servaland makes it out of this somehow. I don't know if they like hit you out of nowhere if like Servaland's still alive I truly don't know I don't know that either I, I feel like if they ever if they do hit us with the Servaland came out of it the explanation will be while she ran to the teleporter room and she teleported out somehow yeah because that's the final thing we see of Servaland is her trying to teleport out yeah who knows she, how she's going to do she's that she's actually wearing black in this episode again which I only wanted to bring up because again it's a whole morning thing she went from white before her children died and children of to black afterwards yeah and yeah, so Series D is kind of a clean slate for us. Again, we're going to be doing a new segment every week. Or every, every uh, season. Yeah, every, well, every, series. Se- every season we do a new segment. We're doing a, a new installment every week is what I meant to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. A new weekly segment. And are we giving away what that is? Well, that's what I was just wondering. Do we want to give away what it is now? Didn't we do that for the what would Blake do? I think we did. All right, so might as well just do it now. Yeah, so the the segment for Series D, which is my creation of the three, this is the only one of th- the, the three, uh, this is the only one I've come up with because the awards were suggested by uh, a listener. This is the one I came up with. It's how would this story be different if it was written by Terry Nation? Because if you didn't know, Terry Nation doesn't write any stories after this. This is actually yep, Terry Nation's last final one. script for the he, show. He goes out with a bang, literally and <laughs> metaphorically. Because this was this is my favorite episode of Blake. I didn't mention this, but this is my favorite episode of Blake 7. Bar none, Mighty it's not even high close. Praise. Aftermath is my second favorite, and it's not even close. This is so far and above that. Mighty high praise. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so next season we'll be talking about every episode, how it would be different if Terry Nation was the one who scripted it, rather than whatever story-specific writer they got that week. Whatever hack they got that week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Which, but like yeah, Keon said, has the potential for greatness, but also has the potential to completely suck. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, I think. Yeah, and I, we're also thinking of putting this at the end of of uh, our episodes instead yeah. of intersplicing so them. So kind like of like, like the do. rankings we did in right. Series B. So that we can have a more cohesive and interesting discussion about this hypothetical universe where Terry Nation wrote the episode. <laughs> this hypothetical <laughs> universe where Terry Nation wrote all of Series D like he did with Series A. And with that... If you don't have anything else to say, we have some emails or an email possibly to respond to. Yeah, I just want to ask because I don't even know where I stand on this, but would you say C is your favorite series? Yeah, yeah you so would? far. Mm-hmm. I'd say yeah. I'd put B as a close second. I'd say A is my least favorite, which isn't to say I don't like it. I just think of the three, it's the one hmm. I find least interesting, I guess. Huh. Yeah, I don't know where I stand. I think A is my favorite 
Hmm. But I don't know. We'll, we'll have to do a different we'll ranking, ranking at, the, at end. the end of Series D. Yeah. We'll have to do like a top five episodes thing too. When we end the show. Yeah. Yep. So we'll go ahead. Uh, we have an email from IG to respond to. The subject line is Terminus. I see you made the same mistake that we both did and confused Terminal with Terminus. Okay. Hiya, evolved humanoids. This episode is very engaging, but also fills me with deep sadness. We learn that Blake is dead or is Serverland lying at a C five yeah. minutes ago. <laughs> we lose our beloved Liberator, sponsored by Slime TM. I often wonder if the model builder felt sad as it was slowly destroyed. Oh yeah, before I continue this email, I wanted to say this. We got this awesome explosion of the Liberator yeah. model. They like stuff it with explosives and blow it up and it was awesome. And three seasons of build up with the Liberator and just li- them living on the Liberator and this was a worthy... Way yeah, to end it. I think so. Zen's final words are very touching. The scene is given significant pathos through Michael Keating's acting. Villa and Dana spend some time working together, which is refreshing. Serverland wears another amazing outfit. Why does she just let Dana go from the Liberator? I like how she pushes one of her minions aside as she runs for the teleport. Jacqueline Pierce is in fine form in this episode. Avon smiles once the Liberator is gone. I get the feeling that he doesn't care what happens as long as Serverland is in trouble. What will the Liberator crew do next season now that they only have a slow ship? Stay tuned. Down and safe. RG. In regards to the ship next season, I suspect that the ship they're going to get is the ship that Servland took to get to Terminal because she told Avon that he could have that ship in exchange right. for the Liberator and Avon also got Blake. She says it's an older model, something much slower than they're used to. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I almost think Blake 7 is going to become almost, uh, when they get a slow ship, it's going to become almost, what is the show I'm thinking of? Red Dwarf? There's a show where they just spend the entire show on this very slow spaceship moving through space, and most of the episodes are are character pieces between the episodes on the spaceship. Huh. Was it a British show? Dark Matter did it sometimes. Sometimes, Dark Matter, at one point, they get this blink drive that can take them anywhere in the universe in a blink of an eye. That's why it's called the blink drive, but then it breaks down like five episodes later, and and in fact, their entire faucet and light system breaks down. There's a couple episodes where they're flying at like regular speed, and they're like doing these... These pieces that are that are just kind of conflict pieces between the characters. So I'm curious to see what they're going to do with that actually next season. If they'll just like ignore it and have them go from planet to planet anyway, or if there's actually going to be some episodes where they're like, we're going to take another week to reach the planet we're going to get to, so let's just chill. You know. Yeah, that'll be an interesting, you know, sort of thing to see what happens. I guess. Mm-hmm. So thank you for emailing us, RG. Yep. And I think with that being said, we'll sign off Series C by saying that you can email us at thedoctordecadentvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on what was supposed to be the original finale of the show and what became just another season finale. I think it'll be interesting, this is just an aside, when we get to the end of Series D to talk about which we think serves as a better, quote, end to the show. Yeah, for sure. Terminal or Blake, the final episode's called Blake. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Zenith, a Blake 7 podcast. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Be sure to recommend us to friends because we're almost out of podcast episodes to release. <laughs> check us on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time, like we mentioned, we're going to have be having uh, John from Making Blake 7 on uh, to discuss Rescue. But until then, the end. <laughs>